And we get about 200,000 visitors a year, um, which is pretty good for a small park like ours. And we talk about the 1957-1958 school year in which Little Rock Central High School is integrated. Now, about 25% of our visitors are from outside of the United States. So, so far I've met a person from every continent except Antarctica inside our visitor center. And many people are studying American history, in particular the American Civil Rights Movement. And so our park is a destination for that because this kind of marks the beginning of what people consider the modern civil rights movement in terms of major events. So, oh, I went the wrong way. Okay, did I answer that? <laughs> Can I hit that? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, our story at the heart of it is about nine kids and this country struggle with the definition of American citizenship. Now, for a long time, since the beginning of my country, citizenship has, the term citizenship has evolved, right? First, just white male property owners were the only people who were considered citizens. And so, as the Supreme Court worked out these definitions of citizenship, the United States is embarked into a civil war. It's split in half. And what was the civil war all about? Well, what were they fighting about? Slavery. Slavery. Some people say states' rights, but if you look at most states' secession papers, all of them mention slavery as a catalyst of the Civil War. And it was about the expansion or the upkeep of slavery. As the United States gains more territory out west, there is this fine, very, a lot of tension if slavery is going to expand with the United States. And so they come up with these compromises and these treaties, but the South is very powerful and very rich in natural resources, and particularly king kind, and also in human capital. Humans are worth a lot of money in the American slave trade. And the North doesn't feel comfortable as the South gets more powerful. The expansion of slavery is going to change the dynamics in Washington, D.C., which a lot of states have outlawed slavery in the Northeast. Now, the South succeeds from the Union, and the Union and Confederacy go to war. Who wins, the North or the South? The Union, yes. <laughs> and slavery is abolished in the United States. Now, the Civil War tears the country apart. Physically, emotionally, figuratively, the country is torn apart. And so, with the country being torn apart, we have to build ourselves back together again. And with Reconstruction, that is part of that building, rebuilding the country in the way it wants to be from this moment forward. And so you have to invest in infrastructure because the South is demolished after the end of the Civil War. And you also have to invest in definitions and you have about 15 million people who once upon a time were not considered human before the Civil War and those were they formerly enslaved. They were only considered three-fifths of a human being by law. So they were definitely not considered citizens if they weren't even considered human beings. So they add the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution to define, to define these newly free slaves. Now, the 13th Amendment officially abolished the slavery. The only exception, if you're being punished for a crime, you are technically a slave of the United States. 14th Amendment defines citizenship. Now, would anybody like to read this definition of the 14th Amendment? Yes, sir. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. Without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Okay. So 14th Amendment establishes citizenship once and for all. So birthright takes care of all of the informed, formerly enslaved. They were all born here in the United States. Therefore, they are citizens of the United States. Naturalization takes care of immigrants. Now, you can become a citizen of the United States if you are naturalized. So this is when citizenship is formally defined and the primary term, equal protection of the law. 
Now, Reconstruction is a very prosperous time for the formerly enslaved and African Americans. For the very first time, they can own property, they can open up their own schools, their own churches, decide what time they're going to wake up, decide what time they're going to bed. But Reconstruction is very expensive because, number one, federal troops actually occupy the South to make sure the formerly enslaved are protected. Those Confederate soldiers seeking revenge, trying to take away their voting rights, trying to take away their property. These federal troops actually occupy the land to make sure those things don't happen. But to keep them there, that's very expensive and it's also very unpopular and Reconstruction ends after eight years. And so a new system arises after the end of Reconstruction. Mississippi was the first state to pass a series of laws and these laws were called, known as the Black Codes. They governed the civil liberties of African Americans in the state of Mississippi. Then slowly but surely, state after state after state after state started adopting laws similar to the Black Codes, which segregate people by the color of their skin. And these laws were solidified by the Supreme Court in the 1896 verdict of Plessy versus Ferguson that said, separate but equal is constitutional. But if facilities are separate, they have to be equal. And these laws get a nickname, and they're known as the Jim Crow laws. What kind of places were segregated by Jim Crow laws? Public places. Public places. Everything. Cemeteries. Here, the Little Rock School of the Deaf and the Blind is segregated. Birmingham, Alabama has a book called the Segregation Law Book of Play. P-L-A-Y. That meant it was against the law for black and white people to play with each other. And it listed football, soccer, basketball, baseball, jacks. It's the good law to play jacks with a person of a different race in Birmingham. And this is the law, and what happens if you break the law? You're arrested. You may go to jail, and in the case of the segregation law book of play, you got a $250 ticket if you get caught playing with a person of a different race. 17 states across the United States have these laws. And the United States it's changing slowly but surely. In 1948, after the end of World War II, the United States integrates their armed forces. Also in 1948, a young man named Jackie Robinson hits the scene. Who is Jackie Robinson? Baseball player. Baseball player. He integrates the major leagues. And in 1954, the NAACP, which stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, they finally get their day before the Supreme Court. This court case is years in the making, and it has to do with public schools. And in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education is argued before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court rules separate but equal in public schools has no place. And it officially undoes the Plessy versus Ferguson verdict. Now, since separate but equal is not constitutional, this is a shockwave across the country. Like I said, 17 states have laws that outlaw segregated, that outlaw integrated schools in their states, and Arkansas is one of them. Now, we talk about Little Rock Central High School because Little Rock Central High School becomes the focal point of, Plessy's, of Brown versus the Board of Education. Now, Central is a very impressive school. Central was built in 1927, and it was the largest high school in the United States. It's 150,000 square feet, five floors, two basement. It takes up two city blocks of the city of Little Rock. And in 1927, it is also the most expensive high school ever built in the United States. The city of Little Rock spent $1.5 million on its construction back in 1927. Now, two years after they built Central High School, the city of Little Rock opens Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. Now, Dunbar and Central were supposed to be built the same year, but the city of Little Rock blows the entire school budget on Central High School. So it takes two years later before the African American community can fundraise and get enough money to open up Central, uh, Dunbar High. They actually get a large donation from the Walsenwall Foundation, which invests in color, people's collegiate education, and they build Paul Lawrence Dunbar two years after Central is open. Now, separate but equal was the law, but let's see how equal this was. Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School only cost $400,000 to build, Central $1.5 million. Our tax dollars segregated, even though everything else is segregated? No. 
Tax dollars have no color. So African Americans who are putting into their taxes don't even benefit from the public schools that are supposed to be invested in them as well. Now, Central is 600,000 square feet if you accommodate all the floors of the building. Dunbar is only 112,000 square feet. Dunbar has grades 7 through 12 and a junior college inside. Dunbar was considered the finest Negro high school in the, in the state of Arkansas. So children from all over the state came to Dunbar. They put room and board at churches so they could attend this great high school. But Dunbar gets so overcrowded at one time, they have to go to school in shifts. Seventh and through ninth grade, go in the morning. 10th through 12th grade, go in the afternoon. Do you get the same education if you only go to school half a day? So, Central is the place to be. In 1957, when it officially integrates, it's ranked number five in the nation. So athletically, it didn't do that bad either. The 57 school year, that summer prior, two students get drafted right out of high school straight into the major leagues. So athletically and academically, Central was a phenomenal school. Now, Dunbar has to take the hand-me-down textbooks of Central. And a lot of students at Dunbar said, that the students at Central knew they were, the, the black high school was getting their old books, so they'll write little dirty messages in them for them because they knew they were getting the hand-me-down books. No gymnasium, no practice fields, and look at the salary difference between the two principals. Now, both of these are city and state employees of the city of Little Rock, but look at the differences in this. Now, a lot of people think the Civil Rights Movement was about black people and white people holding hands, singing Kumbaya. I love a sing along just like everybody else, but the real purpose of the Civil Rights Movement was about equal access to the same resources. Education was the great equalizer. It still is the great equalizer. That means people with bachelor's degrees make more money than people with just high school diplomas. If you don't have a high school diploma, your future looks very dark. And so even back then, they knew the power of education, and that's why Brown versus the Board of Education was so important. Now, how do you integrate or desegregate a school? Brown versus the Board of Education rules that schools cannot be racially segregated, but they don't give any instructions on how you're supposed to desegregate your school. So the city of Little Rock has to come up with their own plan. Now, other schools have integrated in the state of Arkansas. Central is not the first school. Three small schools have integrated three years prior to Central High School's integration. Small school in Hoxie, Fayetteville, and Charleston integrate two months after the, after the Brown decision. And so Central is a very large school district, and Brown versus the Board of Education says schools must integrate with all deliberate speed. How fast is all deliver speed? Doesn't really define that, does it? So after the Brown decision, the Little Rock School District says they will go through with an integration plan originally, but then they start getting a lot of negative feedback about integrating Central High School. And so they kind of stop on their plan to integrate Central High. But there's a lady named Daisy Bates. She's the Arkansas chapter president of the NAACP. After the Brown decision, she starts knocking on doors telling people, go enroll your children to these schools. You can integrate these schools now. Go enroll them. They go to the Little Rock School District and they are told no by the Little Rock School District. Now, do the parents give up and just go home and say, we'll try again later? No, they organize and they sue the Little Rock School District. The Little Rock School District had already came up with a plan, and that plan was known as the Blossom Plan, in which they're starting with the high schools and move down to the elementary schools. And so with the Aaron versus Cooper case, they come up with a compromise that said they will go through with the integration plan that was originally set forth. Starting in the fall of 1957, Little Rock Central High School will integrate. So since you've got a school that you're planning on integrating, you need volunteers to integrate said high school. So they sent a volunteer sheet to now Paul Lawrence Dunbar Junior High School and Horace Mann High School, which is the new all black high school, asking for volunteers. Who wants to integrate Central High? 200 kids originally signed up to integrate Central High, 200. But we only talk about the Little Rock who? Nine. What happened to everybody else? Any idea? Well, like I said, the Little Rock School District got to choose how they wanted to integrate. 
So they came up with their own list of criteria. First thing first, they checked the academic records of the African-American students. They wanted only the best and the brightest of the black students. Then they checked their behavior records. They didn't want any troublemakers to come to their school. And how did they define a troublemaker? How many of you all ever got in trouble in high school? Troublemakers, none of you could go to Central High. Now, they also listed reasons too loud. Too pretty. Yes, why that student was marked off the list. And then they gave them three rules. One rule, no extracurricular activities. They're only integrating math, science, English, and history. So no sports, no clubs, no bands. You can't even go to football games or basketball games. You can't go to prom. So a lot of students say, no deal, we'll stay at Horace Mann. Rule number two, you have to find your own way to school each day. They were not gonna provide you with transportation. And rule number three, and the most important rule in the mall, if you be pushed, shoved, kicked, spat on, punched, you're not allowed to retaliate against your abusers. What does retaliate mean? Fight back. You have to remain nonviolent at all times. They were given the Jackie Robinson litmus test, they were told. That means they have to behave just like Jackie Robinson at all times. Jackie Robinson was spat on, kicked, punched, hit with baseballs, but he never fought back. They expected that same behavior out of these teenagers, 14 to 17 years old. Now, after all that, 17 still want to go to Central High School and 17 passed the cut. But then their names are released in the newspaper and the radio. And for some parents, this was the first time they learned their child volunteered to go to Central High. Melba Patil's dad was driving home for work and he heard Melba's name on the radio. And you can imagine as a parent, your child has volunteered to integrate a school and they haven't discussed this with you. So as a parent, you have your own fears because this is the 50s and this is the South. Little Rock is seen as a progressive Southern city up to this point. They don't have all the lynchings and the rampant race violence that was happening all across the South but it is right on the back door of these places where all of this stuff is happening, such as Memphis, such as Mississippi. And in 1955, a young man named Emmett Till made national news because of his murder. He's murdered in Money, Mississippi for allegedly whistling at a white lady. And this is two years prior to Central High School's integration, and most of the little right now are the same age as Emmett Till. They're 14 in 1955, just like him. And Money, Mississippi is only three hours down the street. So you can imagine as a, as a parent, your child has volunteered to do something that can potentially be dangerous. And if that doesn't scare you enough, parents start getting phone calls once those names are dropped. And they are told if your child integrates Central, you'll lose your job. And that's why we only end up with nine to integrate Central. Now on the first day of school, 10 students do show up, 10. But one young lady, her name was Jane Hill, her, parents' employers saw her on the news and they said, if Jane goes to that school, you'll be fired. And so they make Jane go back to Horace Mann. So 10 show up on their first day, but only nine actually get inside to complete the school year. Now, here are the, the political heavyweights of this story. You have Governor Orville Favis. Governor Orville Favis is seen as a moderate Democrat up to this point. He has integrated the Arkansas State Legislature, and he has a lot of African Americans in his cabinets. The buses are integrated here in Little Rock under his watch. Those schools that integrate in Arkansas, he doesn't stand in the way at all. He lets them integrate. But segregation becomes a big topic politically as he enters his next run for governor office. And he almost loses the Democratic nomination to an ardent segregationist and so he takes the platform, if the people of Arkansas do not want to integrate, I will not force them. And so Governor Favis makes some very interesting decisions when it comes to the desegregation of Central High. And then you have President Dwight Eisenhower, who's a Republican. When the Brown decision comes down, he doesn't necessarily agree with the Brown decision. He says the country is not ready for this. But he also is a firm believer in federal law and order. And so if the Supreme Court says it was going to happen, he's going to abide by that ruling. Now, the day before the first day of school, Governor Orville Favis has a live news podcast 
around 7 o'clock that evening. And then in that news broadcast, he says, I have evidence that thousands of people have armed themselves with guns and knives, and I'm afraid if the Negro students get inside, there will be blood in the streets. Therefore, I have deployed the Arkansas National Guard to preserve peace and order here. Now, I got to ask you guys a question. Imagine this is the day before your first day of school, and the governor just said thousands of people are heading to your school with guns and knives. Would you show up to school on the first day? No. So September 3rd comes around. None of the Little Rock Nine show up, and a good chunk of the white students, they don't show up as well. They're not quite sure in the environment. Now, the first day of school goes by. The National Guard have the school completely surrounded. Nothing happens on September the 3rd. But you know, even though the Little Rock Nine don't show up on the first day, about 100 reporters from all over the country show up. This is the first time in history you can live stream video. And so they're going, they hear there's going to be blood in the streets. They show up bright and early <laughs> to see what's happening. The first day of school goes by, nothing happens. And so the superintendent tells the Little Rock Nine, okay, it's not as bad as the governor said it was going to be. Come to school on the next day, but do not bring your parents. He was afraid that the crowd may harm the adults, but he said they won't harm the kids. So come to school by yourself on the second day. Now, Daisy Bates, she hears that these kids have to go to school by themselves. She doesn't feel comfortable with that. So she decides, since you can't go to school with your parents, we'll go to school together. And she calls four ministers to walk with the Little Rock Nine on the first day. And two of them were white and two of them were black. Her hope is that the religious personnel walking with the Little Rock Nine will stop anyone from physically attacking them. But by the time she gets ministers to agree to walk with the kids, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Now it's 1957. Is there such thing as a cell phone at this point? And so she gets in contact with all of them, except for two. Two of them never get that message to meet up with Daisy Bates on the first day. And one of those students was Elizabeth Eckford at 15 years old. She did not have a home telephone installed in her house. And so Daisy Bates knows she hasn't talked to the Eckford family, but she says, I'll tell them in the morning. The morning comes and she gets very busy and she begins to tell Elizabeth Eckford, who's already on her way to school. So Elizabeth shows up bright and early like she was originally told. Now she tries to enter one door of Central High School because the majority of the crowd has accumulated in front of Central High. So she tries one of the side doors, but as she approaches the side door, the National Guardsmen stand in her way. They won't let her pass. Elizabeth tries to explain to them she's enrolled in Central High, and the guard still doesn't say anything, but eventually one of them points to the side. Elizabeth thinks he's telling her to go through another door. After all, there are 24 entrances in Central High, and so she decides to use one of the front entrance. Now, as she rounds the corner, she passes by a pack of reporters, and she's the first black student to arrive. When the reporters spot her, they surround her, they swarm her, they start taking her pictures, they start videotaping her. All this commotion by the reporters gets the attention of the angry crowd that's already protesting in front of Central High. And then a mob of about 150 people start to follow behind Elizabeth down Park Street. Now, this photograph becomes the most fatal, famous photograph of this incident. Um, what stands out to you about this photograph? Yeah. So, because this is not ancient history, we know who these people are. And, uh, in particular, most people zoom in on these two young ladies. We know this is Elizabeth Eckford. We also know this is Hazel Bryant. She is 15 years old. She's the exact same age as Elizabeth Eckford. Now, Hazel's side of the story was she was showing up to school just like any other day. And she spotted Elizabeth. She spotted the protesters. And so she got right behind Elizabeth and starts to protest as well. She said she had been told from a very early age that race mixing was a sin and it spread diseases. And so she decides she wants to protest that day. She also admits she saw the cameras there. So she gets right behind Elizabeth to get that photo op of her protesting. She doesn't even know this, this photograph is reproduced, reproduced thousands of times across the country on that day. Now, the photographers, in particular, Will Counts, he says photographers zoom in on her because she was the loudest. She was the most aggressive. And so people have multiple angles of her on that day protesting. Now, years later, Hazel apologized to Elizabeth for her actions. 
she didn't want her children to remember her like this. And she says, my life is more than this one moment. Now, she was 15 years old, and true enough, we change as we grow older. We're not the same people we were when we were younger, but you still have to deal with the consequences of your actions. And part of her consequence, this photo is going to be in somebody's National Archives for forever. She doesn't own the rights of this photograph, and basically she becomes this generic entity of segregation and racism and hate, even though she says she has since changed since this moment. Elizabeth Eckford, as she's walking down Park Street, she hears her screams, and people begin to spit on her as she walks down Park Street. And eventually she gets to a bus stop, and she waits there. And in her mind, the bus stop was the safety point. And also the reporters form a barrier around her. So it's her sitting the bus stop, reporters, and the segregationism protests are right behind her. There's also a lady at the bus stop who's arguing with the crowd. Her name is Grace Lorch. She's a white lady. She is part of the NAACP, but she is also a member of the Communist Party. Now, this is the 50s, so no one knew who Grace Lorch was until that day when people take photos of her arguing with the crowd. So people say, who is this lady arguing with the crowd? Who is this lady escorting Elizabeth onto the bus? And so they dig into it and they find this is Grace Lorch. And they also find she's a member of the Communist Party. Her and her husband are fired from their professional jobs at Philander Smith College because this is during the 50s and if you're a communist, they will ruin your life just like this. She is black, her and her husband are blacklisted all over the United States because of these actions. And they have to move to Canada where he finds his next job as a professor. Now, the rest of the Little Rock Nine show up. And the adults hear what's happening to Elizabeth. They go check on her. The rest of them there, they go and try to, to get inside of Central High School too. And they are eventually told by this National Guardsman, by orders of Governor Fibers, no Negro students allowed in Central High School. Everyone is shocked. The superintendent himself told them to come to school that day. But Governor Fibers said in a news broadcast later, it's my job as governor to keep everyone safe. I have evidence that thousands of people have armed themselves with guns and knives. And how do I keep everyone safe? I keep the school segregated. The Little Rock Nine missed the first three weeks of school because of this move. Now this move is a direct violation of the federal court order that said the Little Rock School District had to integrate. So the FBI is called in to investigate these claims that thousands of people have brought guns and knives. They eventually find out there's no evidence to suggest these things have happened, and Little Rock and I are told to come to school again on September the 23rd. Now, September the 23rd, that is the day that puts Little Rock, Arkansas on the map. The Little Rock and I are told to come back to school that day. And remember, on the first day, there are only about 300 protesters outside of Central High. But as the news gets out, more and more protesters start to arrive. Uh, by September the 23rd, there are over 1,000 people out there protesting in front of Central High School. Now, the National Guard has been completely removed. So who's in charge of safety and security now? The Little Rock Police Department. There are only 100 officers on the Little Rock Police Force, and there are over 1,000 people out here protesting. So the Chief of Police, Gene Smith, personally escorts the Little Rock Nine in through a back door. They finally get inside of Central High School for the very first time, but once they walk inside those classrooms, over 200 kids walk out of the school. And one young lady, she actually jumps out the, first, the second floor window. Now, imagine this. Hundreds of kids are walking down the school yelling, they're in there, they're in there. A girl jumps out the window. That crowd is already out there protesting, chanting, two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate. What do you think starts to happen when all this starts to happen at the school? Right, it gets very bad outside. They start pushing up against those police lines. The Little Rock Nine only spent two hours in school that day before they have to get escorted out. What is the final straw? One of the segregationists comes in to negotiate with the chief of police and the principal, and he tells them, just give us one of them to lynch. At that point, the chief of police rounds up all the Little Rock Nine and says, we have to move you immediately. He takes them down to the basements, puts them in police cars that are waiting there, covers their heads with blankets, and takes them far away from Central High School. Little Rock Nine said this was the scariest day of the mall. Now, unable to get to the Little Rock Nine, the crowd starts to disperse and starts to attack black civilians who are on the street. This is Alex Wilson. He's a reporter. He was a Marine. He served in World War II. 
And he was there on the first day of school when Elizabeth Eckford walked down Park Street being sped on, being called names, and he refuses to run. But they beat him severely, and this man actually strikes him with a brick in his hand over his head. Now, all of this is being recorded live on national television across the country. To put this in perspective, a brand new episode of I Love Lucy is interrupted 11 times in one day because of what's happening here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Finally, the chief of police has enough. He looks at the mayor and he said, call Governor Fibers to call in the National Guard. The mayor calls Governor Fibers, but Governor Fibers doesn't answer his phone call. So now you're the mayor of Little Rock and your governor won't answer your phone call. Who do you call for help now? The president. Mayor Woodrow Man telegrams President Dwight Eisenhower. President Eisenhower has been following this story on television all day, and he's already spoken to Governor Fathers once about the standoff between the state and the federal government ruling. And he deploys the 101st Airborne Division to come to Little Rock, Arkansas. So on September 24, 1,500 paratroopers have been mobilized from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, this is the 101st Airborne. They are very, they're called the Screaming Eagles. These are very highly specialized troops. These were the first troops to hit, hit the shores of Normandy on D-Day. A lot of these men in 57 had served in the Korean War. He deploys them to come to Little Rock, Arkansas under Operation Arkansas. He also federalizes the Arkansas National Guard. And they arrive and on September the 24th. I met a lady who lived in the neighborhood on that day, and she was six years old. And she said, I thought the Soviets had invaded the United States on that day. And you can imagine as a six-year-old girl, you seeing tanks roll down your street, army helicopters flying over your house. But they are here for Operation Arkansas. And we commemorate our anniversary on September 25th, 1957, because the Little Rock Nine are escorted right through the front doors of Central High School and there are about 2,000 troops there, there at Central High School that day. But President Dwight Eisenhower has mobilized 11,500 troops in Operation Arkansas. Now, this is why this becomes a national park site. This is the first time federal troops are used to enforce the rights of African Americans since Reconstruction. This also starts the method of the Civil Rights Movement. Get the reporters here, get the media here so the rest of the world can watch. The Soviet Union makes a lot of propaganda film during the Cold War about the United States. And they actually use news footage of what's happening in Little Rock, Arkansas in their propaganda films. And one of those films basically says the United States claims to be the land of the free, but look how they treat their citizens. So this becomes an international diplomacy issue as well, as the president himself makes a stance when it comes to civil liberties of African Americans. And they use the same strategy throughout the civil rights movement the Birmingham Children's March, when you see videos of little kids being sprayed by water hoses, being bitten by dogs, the Aniston bus blow up with the Freedom Riders, all of this was a move to make sure the rest of the world can see what's happening in the American South. And the media played a huge role when it comes to the civil liberties of African Americans during the Civil Rights Movement. All right, any questions about anything? Okay, so, and one question back there, no. <laughs> so, like I said, we commemorate the anniversary on September 25th because that is the day that the 101st escorts the Little Rock Knot inside of Central High School. But that was the only the beginning of the story. And, but to commemorate those events, we have events starting on the 22nd, which is next Friday, all the way to the 25th which is the Monday following. And um, the National Park Service has our own events and the city of Little Rock has their events. And so there's gonna be plenty of stuff going on the September 23rd, 24th, and 25th. All our events are free. Uh, most of the events through the city of Little Rock are free. There are a few you have to pay for, but all our events are free. In particular, I wanna highlight um, Imagine if Buildings Could Talk. This is a laser light show with the National Park Service in um, partnership with UCA. And the UCA has a huge laser light show that they're gonna shine on the facade of Central High School. Cause like I said, Central High School turns 90 years old and it's also in memory, memory the 60th commemoration 
of these events as well. And we're going to be showing that Friday, Saturday and Sunday night, 7.30 to 9.30. So uh, you all, everybody is welcome. These, members, these events are free. And so um, they, they got a huge grant from the National Park Foundation to make this happen. So it's going to be very memorable. So bring your lawn chair, bring your kids, and come out there to see. The, if you don't see anything else, definitely come see that. Okay. So... All of the Little Rock Nine who are still with us will be with us here on this weekend. All of them are still with us except Jefferson Thomas and Daisy Bates passed in 1999, but the remaining eight of the Little Rock Nine will be here with us. And all of them grew up to do amazing things across the country. So you have Carlotta Wallace in there. She owns her own real estate firm in Denver, Colorado, and she's also the president of the Little Rock Nine Foundation. And so far, the Little Rock Nine Foundation have put over 100 kids completely through college. And she was the youngest of the Little Rock Nine because in 57, she was 14 years old when she integrated Central High. Now you have Jefferson um, Thomas. Like I said, he passed away in 2010, but he is a veteran of the U.S. Army. He was also a, an accountant for the Department of Defense before he passed away. He was the youngest male of the Little Rock Nine when he integrated Central High. Now Thelma Mothershed Ware, she's a retired guidance counselor and school teacher, and she lives here in Little Rock, Arkansas today. Now Thelma Mothershed Ware represents another minority group. So, because when we say civil rights, what does civil rights mean? What does that term even mean? Equality of all. Equality of all, rights of citizens. And one thing that a lot of us don't think about is a civil right is Americans with disabilities. AD, the ADA is a direct result of the civil rights movement because Thelma in particular was born with tiny holes in her heart. And when she volunteers to go to Central High School, her parents like, this may kill you. You see how big Central High School is, all the stairs. But most of the Little Rock Nine said Thelma was the one that talked them into volunteering to go to Central High. And so on the first day when she's escorted by the 101st Airborne, she's running up all those stairs, keeping up with the 101st, and she actually collapses in the lobby. They arrange for all her classes to be on the first floor so she doesn't have to walk them down stairs all day. Uh, so. Central High School didn't get an elevator until 2002. So just keep in mind that if you can move around freely, you were not allowed in Central High School e either. Or if you were allowed, you were very, it was very difficult to move around such a very large school. So she, she sets the precedent for that movement as well. Elizabeth Effort. Elizabeth Effort was the young lady I told you about on the first day of school. She's a, a veteran of the U.S. Army as well, and she's also a retired probation officer. She lives here in Little Rock, Arkansas today. Now, Elizabeth Eckford's photograph is the most popular one, and um, Elizabeth Eckford, just like most people who experience traumatic events, um, she has PTSD today. She doesn't do a lot of public speaking, and if she does do public speaking, no loud, you can't clap and things like that. But um, one thing I'd like to point out about Elizabeth is people always want to ask her about that day when she shows up by herself. They're like, what happened? What's going on in your mind? What's going on that day? But just think about it. What if you had to talk about one of the worst days of your life over and over again for the past 60 years? You know, People don't think about those, kind of, those things that way. That these are human beings, just like me and you. They're not made of steel. And they carry some of the pain and the trauma that happened 60 years ago. And so Elizabeth Eckford, I just like to put that out there. She may suffer from PTSD today, but she says she has no regrets about her decision. She said if she was asked to do it all over again, she would, because it was worth it to her. And she lives here in Little Rock, Arkansas today. Now you have Gloria Ray Carmark. Gloria Ray is a chemist, a mathematician, and a patent attorney. She was one of the first women to work for IBM in Europe and today she lives in Sweden or the Netherlands today. You have Dr. Terrence Roberts. He's a clinical psychologist and he lives in Pasadena, California today. He actually comes back and works for the university, no, for the Little Rock School District as an integration specialist. Because after Central High School integrates, um, the city resegregates and he comes back in to help Central High School reintegrate after it has already been integrated. 
And Dr. Melba Tiller Bills, she's a journalism professor and a writer. She's the first one to publish a book about what happened this school year. And she lives in Sausalito, California. And she, um, the name of her book is Warriors Don't Cry. And, she'll, and that's probably the most popular book about this incident. And she'll be here, all of them will be here. Um, they also have a book signing at Central High School on September the, that Saturday, September the 23rd, around 1 o'clock, they have a book signing. And Ernest Green, he was the only senior out of the Little Rock Nine, and he graduates from Central High School. And um, when he graduates, he gets four tickets for his graduation. He gets one to his, his grandfather, one to his little brother, one to his mother, and one to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who comes to Ernest Green's graduation. Now, Ernest Green graduation was a huge um, achievement for the Civil Rights Movement. Other schools have integrated, but he's the first one to graduate from these previously segregated schools. And so his graduation proved, number one, black students are smart enough to go to white schools. They are peaceful enough. They're not animals. They could be pushed, kicked, spat on, called names. And, you know, he also proved that they are brave enough. They will not be intimidated by what's happening because they thought the hardest part about going to Central High School was getting through those front doors. The hardest part is actually making it through the school year. For the first couple of months, the, National, the 101st Airborne follows them inside of Central High. Is anybody gonna mess with you when you have an armed paratrooper? Nope. nope. But this ends after Thanksgiving of 1957. And the Little Rock now are left alone inside of Central High School. And back then, there were 1,900 students. Only nine of them were black. And there were actually three Japanese-American students. That was the diversity of Central High School in the 57, 58 school year. And the Little Rock Nine said they only had about 15 friends between the nine of them. So it became very challenging thereafter. And so he lives in Washington, D.C. today. And he worked as assistant secretary of HUD while he, during the President Clinton administration, and he's also an executive of an investment firm in D.C. today. And Minnie Jean Brown, tricky. She's the only one not to make it through the school year. She got expelled from Central High School. Uh, two instances led to her expulsion. The first one happened down in the cafeteria, and it involved a bowl of chili. She's walking through some aisles in the, in between the tables holding her tray, and four boys' chairs are mashed up against her legs, so she's sandwiched in between these four chairs. She says, what happens next? I accidentally on purpose dropped my bowl of chili. Now she's marched off to the office and she's suspended for six days for this action. And she comes back to school and she's also warned, you get in trouble one more time, you're out of here. After her six day suspension, she comes back in the cafeteria and a boy pours a bowl of hot soup on her head. She doesn't do anything, she just marches off to the office and tells the principal, and the principal does expel the boy who poured the soup on her head. But by now, Minnie Jean is known as a hothead. She's been pushed, shoved, kicked, spat on. But she's the only one that's fought back out of all of them. And so in February 1958, two girls were following behind her, and one of the girls fought, throws a purse at the back of her head. Inside of the purse are combination locks that her and her friend collected from the lockers. Now, Minnie Jean does not throw the purse back, but she turns around and says, don't throw things at me, you white trash. And she is expelled for verbal retaliation. Um, she ends up having to finish school in Harlem, New York. And um, today she is still um, very much, she regrets her decision for fighting back because she said she let them get the best of her. But, you know, most people sympathize with Minnie Jean. You know, everybody has a limit. And you can imagine being spelled on, being called names, being kicked and punched, and food thrown on you every day and not fighting back. So most people understand Minnie Jean. But um, she regrets getting expelled from Central. Today she lives in Canada, and her daughter was actually a park ranger at Central High School for many years. And uh, she's still a social and political activist to this day. And um, she will be here along with the Little Rock Nine and next weekend. We get a lot of stories about the National Guard. In one particular, there was this man, you know, and because, like I said, these people just show up at our site. We don't know who they are until they start to speak to us. <laughs> and so we give this whole tour, they like, you know, I was in the National Guard. You're like, what? <laughs> you know, and so we have a lot of these, what we call concealed stories within our site. And one of them was, he was a National Guardsman. He was only 19 years old. 
And he was there on the first day when they kept them out of Central High. And he said, I went back home because he was out of Hope, Arkansas. And he, people said, you're a hero. Thank you for preserving our rights to not go to integrated schools. But when they're federalized, he came back home and they're like, you're a traitor. And he was like, I was just following orders. And he was like, I was a 19-year-old kid. So I was following orders. And so there is individualized pushback. They got a pushback from their communities, their families. But most of them, they, they were soldiers and they were following orders. Now, the Little Rock Nine said the protection wasn't as good after the 101st leave because the 101st is very expensive to keep them there for two whole months. They're doing two weeks at a time tw on 24 hours a day. They're from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and so eventually they send them back home. It's just too expensive to keep them there. And so they said the protection was a lot different after the National Guard takes hold of their primary protectors. And so there was, um, the Little Rock Nine said they could tell um, those, they said there were some that were very enthusiastic about their job. They said some of them were not, they would turn the other cheek if they seen them being um, physically abused and harassed. So, good question. Any other questions? So I can go on and on about this topic, but thank you for sitting here during my long spiel. <laughs> and if you want to know more about this, um, this topic, we are open every day, 9 to 4.30, free admission. Um, we have programs every day as well. And if you, I know we have got a lot of students who are studying. We have, we have archives and things about that, about this, this um, situation in particular. And you know, this story has so many dimensions that you can have a uh, talk about each one of them individually and one by one. But um, again, thank you for sending through my program and visit your national parks.